ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to this conversation with Professor Louise Fresco. Just in short, my name is Franz Swanepoel. I'm the director for, interim director of the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Food Systems and a professor in agricultural transformation in Africa at CAS, the Center for Advancement of Scholarship. The University of Pretoria has a long relationship with Professor Fresco, starting 15, 20 years ago. Uh, we're very honored that the university will confer honorary doctorate uh, in uh, agricultural sciences to her this afternoon. And as part of this occasion, we thought it appropriate while she's on campus to have this conversation with Professor Fresco to learn from her experience over many years about leadership in sustainable food systems, identifying the most important areas for focus in future for sustainable food systems, but with a very specific focus on the African continent. I know that in the conversation which will be held between Professor Lisa Corsten, Professor in Plant Pathology and also the co-director of the Center of Excellence, the, uh, the DSI in our F Center of Excellence in Food Security, uh, that will not necessarily come out because they will speak about Professor Fresco's career, where have, have you worked, what have you done, how do you see leadership, but she were, wouldn't necessarily say this is all the recognitions and awards that I have received over the years. So that's why I thought in terms of making some opening or welcoming remarks, it's appropriate of me to just highlight a few of the recognitions that Professor Fresco has received over the years that will give you a good picture of who we have in front of us. And then we will hand over to Professor Corsten and Professor Fresco to continue the conversation. I would like to tender apologies on behalf of uh, Ms. Bongi Ben-Jobe. She was the former Director General of the National Department of Agriculture and I've worked intimately with Professor Fresco during the time that she was DG year and Professor Fresco was the Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO in Rome. So this would have been a wonderful opportunity for, for Bongi and Louise to have had this conversation. Unfortunately, her flight was cancelled last night in Kigali on route here, and she has just boarded a flight a couple of hours ago, so she's in flight as we speak. But in spirit, she's here, and she said that she would like to follow up afterwards. And she even suggested to have an interview with Professor Fresco this evening over dinner, which I declined on Louise's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> Louise finished a PhD in plant production systems in the early 80s or the mid 80s. Uh, following field work that she has conducted on the African continent. She then went on and became the first female professor in plant production systems at Wageningen University in Research. I say Wageningen University in Research as it is today, but at that time it was only Wageningen University, the research component, similar to our Agricultural Research Council, was a separate entity, but in, uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, they've brought the two together in an adapted land grant model like they have in the United States and which Professor Fresco is also advising South Africa currently on towards piloting land grant models in some of the provinces. Following the stint at the uh, Wageningen University in research, she went on and became the director gen Deputy Director General of the FAO in Rome, again the first woman to have held that position. She held research chairs at the University of Amsterdam, which was specifically created for in the foundations of sustainability. That was at the time when nobody in the world actually spoke about sustainability. It was a vague concept where people thought sustainability, we need to try and do more with less. But she occupied a research chair in the foundations of sustainability. She held visiting professor appointments at the University of Sta at Stanford University in the United States, at Uppsala in Sweden. She has received five honorary doctorates already from different countries in the world. And the university is extremely proud that we will also confer honorary doctorate onto her this afternoon. Uh, she was in 2020 uh, rated as one of the 100 most influential Dutch people she, more recently, she has received a number of awards. 
the one is the commander of the order of the line for the Netherlands, which is the highest order or recognition that one can receive in the Netherlands for your contributions to civil society. In terms of food systems and her work in the food domain, she has received the Norman Berlin Medal from the World, Fo World Prize F World Food Foundation, the World Food Prize, which happens every, every year in Iowa and the United States. She also last year received a prize from the Justice von Liebig uh, Foundation in Bonn, which goes with a cash prize for her contributions globally towards food security. The cash component Louise has, has kindly put into a Louise Fresco fund to support African early career researchers to be mobile across the continent and to visit various universities. Colleagues from Morocco have kindly agreed to also make a contribution. Similarly, will the University of Pretoria that will be uh, launched officially this evening at the dinner which will be hosted by the Dutch ambassador. Louise is very talented. She doesn't only write in science, she also does fiction and she also chairs the board of the Dutch uh, National Opera and Ballet. Thank you very much. This is Professor Louise Fresco. We're looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. I'm very glad that you are here, most importantly, specifically to Professor Fresco. And um, I'm just going to, first of all, just read something and then I'm going to ask Prof Fresco if you recognize the person, <laughs> if it's factual or fiction. So Professor Fresco is a renowned scientist, writer and influential figure in the field of food and agriculture. She is most recognized for her academic achievement. She has also made significant non-academic contributions throughout her life. She held several leadership positions in various institutions and countries, showcasing her exceptional management and organizational skills. And it goes on about the FAO 1996 to 2000, where she was Assistant Director General, and how she's played an important role in food security challenges and promoting sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, Professor Fresco has also been involved in special endeavors that have had notable impact on society. She has actively worked towards bridging the gap between scientific knowledge and policy making, emphasizing the importance of evidence-based decision making in the food field of food and agriculture. Through her writing, speeches and engagements, she has advocated for sustainable and responsible agricultural practices that prioritize environmental conservation, social equity, and food accessibility. And then she has also excelled in communicating complex scientific concepts to a broader audience, making her a prominent advocate for sustainable food systems. She has written and authored several books, including Hamburgers in Paradise, the stories behind the food we eat, the bread, wine, and chocolate the slow loss of foods and wine we love. She also explored the interconnectedness of food culture and sustainability. And her ability to articulate these issues has helped raise public awareness and understanding of the challenges faced by the global food systems. And then uh, a little bit more on she was born in Meppel, uh, the Netherlands. I won't share the birth date, but uh, she grew up on a family uh, farm and uh, this early exposure to agriculture shaped her passion for the field and enabled her to drive and address the challenges within. Uh, she obtained a master's degree in tropical plant sciences, a PhD in agricultural economics, and an academic background combined with her upbringing influenced her perspective on sustainable food production and the importance of food security. Throughout her life, she has made significant contributions to sustainable agriculture and food systems, and her leadership experience, special endeavors, and effective communication have helped shape policies, raise awareness, and advocate for a more sustainable and equitable food future. Prof. That's a lot. 
<laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lifetime. Um, if you would critique this, how would you, would you give it a score? Eight, nine out of ten. What is missing? What's wrong? Well, a couple of details, but I don't think we should manage the details so much. I think what is important when you read a CV like that, you think, oh my God, she must have planning, been planning so well throughout her life. And that, I can tell you, is not the case at all. Most ah. lives, including most of your lives, will not be an easy, smooth path from one step to another. Neither has mine been. You, you stumble upon things from time to time. Something happens to you. You meet somebody. You have an idea. You push that forward. Then another idea comes, another group of people who want to work with you. So. When I look back at, at what you read or what France is telling, it looks so organized, yet it wasn't like that. Um, there were all kinds of ways in which my life would, could have gone into a different direction. And I think it's important to realize when you're young that there is not one path laid out for you, that there may be many pathways. And as I get older, I think what I am most aware of is that it's not so much what you do only, but that it's also very much how you do it, with respect for others, with respect for the issues that you care about, and with a sort of long-term view. Because if you work in agriculture or food or sustainable development, there's no miracle around the corner. There's not just something, you know, that if you only do that, then everything will be solved. It's a painstaking path, trying things out, talking to people, trying to convince people. And so don't be daunted by a CV that reads like a sort of encyclopedia, because that's not how life is. <laughs> that's brilliant. This is a very important lesson for every single one of you. I was reading a page from ChatGPT, which I quickly did. Um, Edwin actually did it for me quickly, 9 o'clock this morning. Um, but to me, the important lesson is this can reflect your CV, but it can never reflect the person mm -hmm. and the challenges and the hardships. So it's very important how we use chat for a very specific pur purpose, but we remain human and it can't reflect that part of the challenges and struggles. So I think it's, to me, the f first very important message to all of you. Um, but um, Prof, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, th I think just sharing with this younger generation and I, I really would like to introduce my final year class they've got a class now and I said well they need to come here they're all okay. young budding plant pathologists thank you Give for away, coming guys <laughs> and uh, it's a very important message to them because today's lecture was really about career paths for them so I thought it's most appropriate um, and I think it's a very important lesson uh, because one tend to when you're younger look at your euros um, and the people that you really think has made it and you wonder how did they get there. Uh, but just remember they are still human and we do make mistakes and it is a tough journey and it is about hard work and commitment. So Prof, I'm Thank going you. to ask you, when you started off, are you one of those workaholics or, or people that just worked or are you very organized? Are you very systematic? Because food systems is really about a systematic approach. Well, I think I was always quite efficient. And nowadays, efficiency has a little bit of a bad ring. But I was capable of, of doing things very intensely and then sort of putting them aside as being done. Um, and I think I still have that. So I'm not a workaholic in the sense that I will always work on the country. I, I love sitting on the couch and doing other things or going for hikes. But when you work, uh, or when I work, I should say, I'm doing it efficiently and I, I want to finish something. Um, and I, th I think it's organizing your time, which is very important. And organizing your time doesn't mean doing as much as you can. It's looking at where is it critical that I, uh, I spend time. For example, in my time at the United Nations at FAO, um, people used to produce reports that were endless, 400 pages, 500 pages, a summary which was incomprehensible. And I immediately thought, if I'm going to read all these reports, I will have no life. So that's not what I'm going to do. 
and I learned how to scan these reports and sort of pick out the right uh, types of, of course this was before ChatGPT, yeah? I could now ask, <laughs> please make me a summary, but at the time <laughs> that didn't exist. But even, even so, scanning uh, a document quickly, that's a form of efficiency, and then putting it aside. The same with speeches. I had, in many United Nations meetings, I had to sit through endless delegations. I mean, there are 195, 195 UN member states and when we had these big uh, general assemblies all of them had to speak and of course although they were given three or four or five minutes they would always go longer and then there were other people speaking so it, it was endless and I got myself very much into a kind of multiple, multiple tasking mode so with one ear I would listen to whoever was speaking and just picking up the right words and with another ear or eye I was trying to do oh. something else at the same time so efficiency and being organized is important and even up to today I always make every morning a little list or sometimes in the evening of what I need to do um, and of course many things don't get done so they get carried on to the next day's list but just getting in your mind and even doing it by hand so that it's actually ingrained in your brain is very good to make a little list of feasible tasks I mean there's certain things like for example you know, mastering uh, sports or musical instruments that's not something that goes on a daily list but for the, the the things that need to be finished making a list is a real recommendation I could give it sounds very silly but it has always helped me I think this is very important a daily lists I, I re and feasible tasks I think that's uh, where a lot of us miss the boat and and maybe the difference between being a leader and being a follower because we need to be organized. Um, there's a little bit of multitasking coming out of this, mm -hmm. uh, Prof. And I think the known woman being a better multitasker is well known. Not necessarily so today. I think uh, men have also acquired multitasking skills. Um, and I think particularly with our cell phones, driving, which we shouldn't be doing, um, reading a document, or as they say, people sitting on the toilet with their cell phones. Uh, <laughs> as something they say we should not be doing. But um, I'm, I'm very glad you, you mentioned the not being a worker alcoholic. So in Japan, they call it karoshi. Uh, and it's something I think a lot of us uh, get confused with. Karoshi means death from overwork. And it is a well-recognized uh, attribute in, in Japan where people often are so committed to the work that they actually work non-stop and they do not step aside for their personal life. So it is about a balance. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a very interesting article this morning by Marinda Kendi. Um, and it is about overwork. Um, the, the notion that the more hours you put in, uh, the more you will achieve. And what we've just now heard, it's not true. And in fact, she was saying that companies prefer not to employ people who's overproductive because they will be less effective. Um, they want people with a, a not driven, but that can drive from the inside, meaning being calm, curious, confident and clear. Um, Prof, what is your take on that and a message to everyone being the overworked? or as you say, being selective and organized? Being overworked in any case does not work because you just get too tired, your critical powers are not in place, so that is nonsense. But the key is, what do you select to concentrate on? So work less, but efficiently, and on the right type of things. So don't waste time on things that are not relevant. And it's very interesting, if you look at all the tasks that you have to accomplish, there are actually a few categories. One is the urgent stuff. There's stuff that's urgent and stuff that's not urgent. And then on the other axis, is there's the stuff that's important or the stuff that's not important. What do you think most people usually do when they make their lists or start working? They go to the urgent, non-important stuff because that gives the satisfaction, okay, I've at least accomplished something. But what you really need to do is to first look at the important stuff and then maybe look at what is really urgent, what is a little bit urgent, and maybe the non-urgent important you can leave a little bit, but to do the urgent non-important is the worst possible choice. 
So you got my, my framework, eh? urgent, not urgent, important, not important. And so making even that kind of little selection, I think uh, helps you a lot to reduce work pressure and anxiety about what you do. And then being honest, you know, sometimes you just have to say, I don't manage this uh, to whoever is your colleague or, or your superior or your prof. You know, sometimes it cannot be done. And then be honest also with yourself. Do you have an excuse, a real excuse? You have a cold, the family dog got sick or whatever, your mother needs you. Or is the excuse perhaps that you don't know how to tackle it? Because this happens very often, that we put the, the difficult things aside because we don't know exactly how to tackle it. And then they accumulate, and then in the end you feel really desperate, and then you think, oh my god, if I work very hard, maybe I can solve this. So if there's something you cannot do, or you don't know how to start or where to start, get help early on. Don't wait until it has accumulated into what we in Dutch, and I think also in Afrikaans, we call the Rechtsebreiberg, you know, the sort of pudding of rice, and you don't know where, where to get into it. You know, ask help. There's nothing wrong in asking help. Of course, by the way, I never did that uh, myself until much <laughs> later in my life, because being the only girl and always the youngest for a long, long period in my life, I thought, if I ask for help, they're going to fire me, or they're going to think I'm stupid or something. But with everybody who's worked with me later on, I always said, ask me if, if what I say is not clear or the instructions are not clear or we don't know how to do it. Let's admit to one another we don't know how to do it and then we'll find out how we do it. But keep in mind urgent, not, uh, urgent and important, those are the categories. And also, if you don't know it, don't let it accumulate. Sure, this is like a speech to me. <laughs> <laughs> I still battle with that. Um, Prof, you're clearly in a leadership uh, role and you make a huge impact. We've heard um, from Prof Swanepoel. Um, we've seen what ChatGPT had to say. An important thing about leadership is also to create an environment for people to, to flourish in, to create opportunities for them to develop their own career paths and to create jobs and jobs for the future and particularly keeping in mind AI. So I was, I'm just going to reference uh, an Oxford University study. In 2013, they found that, they said that 47% of US jobs could be eliminated by AI over the next 20 years. Now, yesterday, last month, Friday, uh, a new Goldman Sachs study emerged and they said 300 million full-time jobs will be lost. And they are talking about within the next five-year cycle with AI. So this is very important. As a leader, what would your message be to the next young generation that's sitting here and obviously concerned about the impact of AI or any other factor that may influence their potential career paths and job opportunities? Well, first of all, I'm just optimistic in the sense that there is always room for bright people. And the future in terms of jobs may not like, like the future of, or not be like our own, my future, the future, your parents or your grandparents. Things change a lot and often for the better. I mean, you know, think of, of heavy industry or mining. A lot of that work was terrible work to do. Are we sad that some of those jobs are lost? No, of course not, because they were not good working conditions. But of course it needs flexibility and what you, I think can do best for yourselves is to try and, and nurture the agility in your mind so that you are adaptive, that you can deal with different circumstances and that you don't define yourself as only being um, so or so or something that, that you, there's only one thing you can do. You'd be amazed at how many different things you can do if you put your mind to it. So don't be afraid. I think that GTP or AI in general and all these other things, robotics is another very good example, are, if we manage it properly, also a very useful tool. They take away a lot of the dreary work. We need to adjust also as a society because it raises issues of, of democracy, of how you know we can actually decide on things. Do we want big companies to decide for us only or do we want to have more of a, a social platform to discuss this? But I, I'm optimistic because throughout history, Every time we have been able to manage new 
technologies, and we've made our lives better with that. Think about electricity. You know, electricity in the beginning was uh, thought to be very dangerous and not to be used unless people were very, very highly educated. Well, think what a difference <laughs> electricity makes uh, uh, in rural villages, whether it's in Africa or elsewhere. It's made a changed life. For example, people could read in the evenings. So all these things will have if we give it a chance, I think also a positive way. And jobs will change, so the, and you will not be the same person in 30 years' time, and no will be, not will, the, the, the job environment or the labor market will not be the same either. So the point is to continue to hone your skills. And I sometimes say to myself, when I have a very rare lazy half day, because <laughs> I'm not lazy by nature, but then I think, you know, every day should be a day on which you learn something. If you stop learning, that's the end of, of being me, in my case, or, or the end of, of productive life in all the senses of the word. You don't need to learn only mathematical formulas or so. Learning a recipe is also fine, or learning to talk with somebody. But this idea that you never stop learning, and hence that you keep the agility and you keep your adaptivity to new circumstances, including new technology, I think is very important. Thank you, Frog. Um, I want to just ask you, describe your lazy day. <laughs> <laughs> well, my lazy, usually half day, because it's fair for me not to be behind my desk at all, would probably start with a walk, um, um, meeting some friends, family, or uh, doing something outside. I think outside is very important, although I live in a country where most of the time it's grey and wet, so. That's a little bit of a drawback, but um, I like cooking, for example, but I also really like reading. Reading for me, and I can't emphasize this enough, reading is so important. And then don't read things that are about you. Most young people have a tendency to read novels that are about their situations, their culture, their countries. Read about other periods historical periods, which are more remote from you. Read about people in different circumstances, in different countries, because that will open your mind. If you read something about, for example, I just read a book about a Malaysian boy trying to find his way uh, during the Second World War. That's far removed in a way, because it's a period I did not witness myself. It's a continent that I know a little bit, but not very much. But the way he described his struggles made me both understand that we share things, even with such a big difference, but also to understand how people's reactions are formed. And novels in particular can do that. Also biographies, but read. Promise me, if there's one thing you remember from this talk, promise me that you think about making a list not a, not a book every day, I'm not being over ambitious here, but at least make a list of the books you want to read every year or every month and read. Do it honestly, even if sometimes you think, well, um, it's a bit difficult. Reading opens your mind. And for me, my lazy day is also reading. Um, Prof, I, this is close to my heart. Um, I also believe in reading, reading every day, reading everything. Be selective in your reading. It's an extremely important message to everyone. And read a physical book, physical, not, just, yes. not just electronically. Why? Yes, yeah. of course, we need to have all these modern devices. But it, it is known through some brain research that actually if you still read a, uh, a physical book and you hold it in your hands, your visual memory is actually improved. Whereas on a, on a screen or on a tablet, all the pages look the same and you don't have the same vis visual reference point. And developing that, that visual memory is also important for you. So we're talking about reading, Prof. Take me to your book, famous book, Hamburgers in Paradise. And uh, I don't know, anyone in the audience, have you read the book? Ah, oh, Franz, thank you. Uh, so the challenge is going to be for everyone to go and get the book and read it. Um, but I want, Prof, please tell me about your book. It's a fascinating exploration of past, present and future relationships with food. So we're putting food in the middle of the table. And this is part of our conversation. Um, it's a f and I'm going to just read a little bit. It's the first time in human history there's food in abundance throughout the world. More people than ever before are now freed of the struggle for daily survival. Yet, few of us are aware of how food lands on our plate. And behind every meal you eat, there's a story. Prof, tell us your story of hamburgers. 
<laughs> well, I wrote the book when I came back from, from Rome, so I had been working for nearly 10 years at the United Nations, and I wanted to organize a kind of sabbatical. And the University of Amsterdam was very kind. They said, okay, we'll create this chair for you, and, and you can basically do what you want. Well, of course, as soon as I landed, everybody wanted me to do everything, but I really carved out some time. Also because I was giving a lot of interviews at the time, and I noticed there was such confusion about issues of food, not just in Europe, but elsewhere as well. And I thought, there's something happening to our relationship with food, and I need to write down what I really think and what I believe. And the more I did that, the more I also got into uh, sort of historical notions of food. Uh, you know, the fact that we as humanity actually developed agriculture is, is such a recent phenomenon. It's 10,000 years away. That's nothing in, you know, the maybe three, billion, three million years that something akin to the predecessors of human beings have been uh, on this earth. So it's a very recent phenomenon. And most of the people in this world have been either uh, and most, I mean, really 95% if you count the whole world population over time, have been either hunters and gatherers or agriculturalists. So the fact now that we have such a sizable proportion of people in cities, two thirds of the world population, who have actually relinquished and often ignore their links with food production, with the food chain, and only see the consumer part, is really something to worry about because it nurtures a lot of confusion and you get people thinking that they shouldn't eat gluten, they shouldn't drink milk, they shouldn't eat meat. And food, of course, everywhere, in every society, whether it is in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago, or in uh, North Africa maybe 700 years ago, it's always uh, been a matter of identity. It's a matter of identity today. You have people, if you tell me, for example, I don't want to drink milk and I don't want to eat meat. That already says something about who you want to project be, to be, who you want to be, who you feel you are. And there's no moral judgment on my side, but it shows that food is always identity. But yet, at the same time, we know so little about it. We know very little, most people, about how does that piece of meat or how does the milk come onto your plate? What is behind that? Because we've lost the connection with rural areas. And even agriculture stu students have a strange disconnect between what they know, theoretically, in their profession about farming and how it actually lands on their, uh, on their plate. There's hardly anything we as, as urbanized people eat that hasn't been somehow processed. Even if, if you eat an apple, a green apple, whatever, um, it has been touched by other human hands, not just to pick it, but also to preserve it, but sometimes to coat it, um, to irradiate it so that it doesn't get bad immediately, to store it, to find some cold storage and so on. It's only those who really still live on the farm who actually harvest some of their food directly, but never all of their food. So we become, in other words, dependent on hundreds of thousands, millions of people somewhere in the world, anonymous to us. And we don't have the respect anymore for all that work that is behind the, the, the food that we eat. So if you look at your food tonight, think about what has happened. What, why is this food today on your plate? Yes, you bought it. And maybe, yes, you responded to some kind of an advertisement that said, you must eat this cereal because it's very healthy to you. Um, but there is a whole chain of stories behind it. How did it get there? Who cultivated it? How was it actually protected from bugs and insects? How did it actually get fertilized? Who produced the fertilizer? Where does it come from? Does it actually come from South Africa or from some, somewhere else? With the ignorance that many people have about food, also there's a lot of fear or a lot of misunderstanding. Um, food is both uh, a source of joy, but it's also a source of fear for many people. If I eat such and such, I may get sick. Of course, that's also historically so, but it's even more so today with the ignorance that many people have about food. So that's why I spent some time making the book, but also a documentary series, um, and I gave a copy of that because it has an English translation also yeah. to Professor Cooper to sort of show 
the simple stories about food, and, and not simple in the sense of being simplistic, but it's so important that you are aware of what you eat. I believe very much that many of the problems that we have today with obesity or with malnourishment, apart from poverty, have also really a, a perception problem. People don't know what is good food. People uh, uh, sometimes throw away a lot of food when it's unnecessary. And a big achievement, not, not mine of course, but in my lifetime has been to really drastically reduce the number of people who are hungry or malnourished. But it's not enough. We still have 10, 11% of the people who are not well nourished, of the world population, I mean, and here in, in this country it's even higher. And that is our real task, to produce sustainable food that is nutritious and that is healthy and safe. And I end last but not least, affordable. One of the real risks of the current economic crisis is that food becomes less affordable. And so all that was in my mind, but I thought I have to write that up as a nice story. So I, um, I added in a lot about art and uh, all kinds of other things from which we can learn something. Because if you make it a boring sort of negative story, nobody wants to read it. So that is, and you can check it out on the internet. Also, in, in fact, also my TED talk. I did one of these yeah. uh, TED talks about food, and I'm, this is this is my greatest achievement in a way, <laughs> is that this TED talk that you know you know what TED is T E D yeah. yeah you heard about that. Huh? So I was asked while I was writing this book, I was asked, do you want to do a TED talk? I, ignorant as I was, I thought TED, and in Los Angeles, I mean, I'm not going to fly to Los Angeles for. <laughs> Uh, they said, you get 18 minutes. I said, 18 minutes and all the way to Los Angeles. Then I asked my students, I said, what is that? They said, yes, you must go. You must go. It's the most important <laughs> in the world. Um, so off I went. I landed. And straight away in the afternoon, I had to give my TED talk. So I was uh, not as concentrated <laughs> as I can be. But that TED talk has been viewed, I think, 1.3 million times. It's been translated into 50 languages. <laughs> And this is, we're talking about something that happened 15 years ago or something, or a little less. Um, it showed me the power of, of social media. And, and I'm extremely delighted that it's there free of charge on the internet and that people can see things and discuss it. I have no idea whether all these translations are accurate, but it doesn't matter. The point is, the point is that you have to reach out. So all that to tell you that I wrote a book, I love doing it, and even up to today, getting feedback on it is such a pleasure. So, so in other words, the lesson for you is I don't want you all to be authors. I'm already quite happy if you become readers. But do write down things that you note. Do write thing, down things for yourself. Because writing is a way of creating awareness. And for me, putting that all together, it's quite a big book, was really a way of, of putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. And it's, it's such fun doing that, to create your own awareness. So read and write. That's very powerful, read and write. I think everyone should be committed to, to read and write. And they do say everyone should actually at least write a book in your lifetime. It doesn't have to be a big book. <laughs> it can be very short. Um, and um, I, I think it's, it's very important because it's also our legacy. And, and maybe it's something we want to share with our family um, or friends. So uh, do read and do write. And that's very important. Um, I, I want to just take you uh, Prof, this TED show, I actually watched it this morning and it's brilliant. Uh, please, everyone go and watch. And what to me was fascinating, the microwave and the bread and everything was on the table. And I was actually making a bread while giving a speech, which is, um, and then jet lagged is quite a feat. <laughs> so I think that's very powerful, the powerful uh, way of how we convey our messages, how we we engage the audience. So I'm going to engage the audience. I'm going to ask Velika to, to bring a bunch of flowers here because, and I want to give that to you, Prof. Oh, that's, um, and these are because, Kerberos. Very nice. Yeah, Thank you. so um, I'm going to use the, and Velika is, is also Dutch, so we- uh, Yes, yes okay. I know. You can say <laughs> a few words. Oh, that's very nice. Oranje you. Blomberg, yeah. well, right. Oranje. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. That's yeah. very sweet, very kind of you. Thank you. And I can, can I perhaps ask you to bring me my bottle of water as well? Yeah, yeah does so, it smell very much? Very nice, thank you. So I Super, want to uh, use the flower concept and specifically the petals of the flower because 
um, there's a very nice uh, um, way of demonstrating leadership. And we are talking about leadership, leadership and sustainable food systems. And if I look at the qualities of leadership, and we can use the flower to illustrate that if you pick these little petals one by one and you unpack what is true leadership. And I'm just quickly going to read a few. Honesty, efficient communication, knowledge, consistency, visionary outlook. And I'm going to come back to this one. Selflessness, very importantly, courage, willpower, and I want to end with honesty because I think it starts and ends, life starts and ends with honesty. We have to be honest to ourselves for such a powerful message you gave. Be honest what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, be honest to people. Um, and maybe it's something we take a long time in our lives to, to, to be honest to ourselves, but you have to follow that journey. Um, you have to, at this stage in your career where you are now, you are being students, undergrad or postgrad, you have to acquire that knowledge and deep knowledge. Um, you shouldn't branch out too much now, but the challenge is there to look at transdisciplinary research and expand that scope. Um, but and, and selflessness is a very important attribute. Mm -hmm. um, but very importantly, having that vision for the people, particularly if you're going to be the leader. So my question is, and, and it's a very important thing, are we born leaders, do you think, or do we become a leader? Is it our destiny to be a leader? Because most people that will be in this audience will most likely become the leaders of the future. What is your take on that leadership? I think that's a very interesting question. My feeling would first be to say the different types of leadership uh, niches or roles so not everything that's called a leader is the same type of leader so uh, people may be leaders in different places uh, and you may be a leader even if it isn't uh, very visual to the outside world that you are a leader um, at the same time i think people also are partly made a leader through circumstances i mean a very good example is um, President Zelensky of Ukraine. Oh, I yes. think he has really grown. If you look at the first yeah. um, messages he gave, and if you look at them uh, that he gave a, a year later, you see how he's grown in stature and confidence yeah. and so on. But the point is to take advantage of the opportunities that you are given by coincidences and, and, and the environment to develop your own leadership qualities. I mean, you never become a leader just by sitting uh, on a chair and just waiting for somebody to bring you on a silver tray a leadership position. You have to get to know yourself. You have to also challenge and stretch yourself. Where can I go? What do I do wrong? Self-insight is very important. And I think it, it I mentioned you don't mention, but for me, I think it's part of becoming a leader is also curios curiosity. Oh, yeah. To, to be curious about the world around you, to be curious about what needs to be done to change things, I think is a, is a very, very important part of being a leader or just being a rounded individual. And I don't think one should walk around in life um, just thinking, I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to be a leader. I don't think, it, at least it didn't work for me at all. I never thought, even today, you guys are all saying I'm a leader, but it didn't really feel so much as ever a choice wanting to be a leader. It's just wanting to be in a place where I can make a difference. And I think making a difference is important uh, because if you formulate it that way, uh, it's about modesty also. A leader can never stand on his or her own. And one of the most important things is to give credit to others. The worst leaders, and believe me, I've seen a few around, are the ones who surround themselves by people who just say the same thing as they do, who do not accept criticism and who isolate themselves. And to be a true leader, you have to uh, let other people shine and not shine yourself. What, a long, long time ago when I was doing my PhD, my professor, and again I was the only girl in a group of male PhD, and, my, and I was upset one day because somebody took away my um, something I had done, but this was about modeling stuff. Uh, and, and I was really upset. And he said, take it as a compliment. You don't need to shine, your ideas need to shine. 
And I think that is a very important part. If a leader is egoistical, if a leader is self-centered, he or she cannot be a good leader. You have to accept that you're not always the brightest, but that you, your role is to promote the others that must be given a chance to be bright and to shine. That's very, very important, very powerful. I, um, I, I think that the ideas that need to shine, so because one will shine through that, and that's so powerful and so important to everyone in the group. Uh, there's an important aspect that came out, and that's the aspect around gender. You've mentioned being mm -hmm. a, a female, and, and most, most of us know that uh, in agriculture it was a very male-dominated world, and things have changed. What is your take on, on the role of females in a leadership position, and then particularly in agriculture? Um, well, let me make one, one correction there. I think agriculture very much, particularly in Africa, is a female-dominated industry when you talk about farming. It ha it's a male domain in many universities, in many government departments, and so on. And, and that just shows that many of the women are invisible. I, I feel very strongly that our talk today, our narrative, present narrative, should be about diversity and not just about gender itself. Uh, I think what has hampered many girls is um, prejudice, is lack of self-confidence, is lack of a mentor. I must admit, I have never had a mentor, and probably did a lot of things wrong, but I have now been a, member, a mentor to many, many girls and young women, and that's a very satisfying situation. So try, uh, if you're a girl, to find a mentor. It doesn't need to be a woman. Somebody who can just be honest with you, reflect on what you do, um, say critical things when needed, praise when needed. That mentorship is very important. But I think the wider issue is that you cannot function well as a leader, or as a team, if there's not enough diversity in ideas and backgrounds and experience. And that diversity is not just a matter of gender, it's not just a matter of ethnic background. Uh, there's so many more dimensions, religion, discipline, your family background, uh, what you've read, what you've lived through. There, there are so many dimensions that make up you. And one of the things to think about, um, whether you're a girl or a boy, is what makes up me? What is so special about me? Because you are special, all of you are special. And knowing what, what makes you special helps you also to define where you can make a difference. You, just you, not someone in general. So I think knowing yourself, whether girl or boy, is an important part of feminism if you, or of diversity, yeah. if you want. That's very important, and I um, I apologize for the noise. I hope they're going to stop it on that Can you side. hear us okay at the back? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've spoken about agriculture, and we do know what's the predictions based on AI and job security, that uh, the, 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 the field that will be the, the best positioned in the future is, funny enough, agriculture. So to all the agriculturists in the audience, uh, you have a bright future, and also education. So that's what they predict. Um, but I want to take a step forward to food. Yesterday we had wonderful discussions. Joanne is here and my colleagues in food nutrition. Where is Hetty? I saw her earlier. Uh, and Noshad is here. And uh, we had very important discussions about the link between agriculture and food. And perhaps in government and perhaps in society we don't make that link and we don't mm -hmm. pull it through from that's, the seat that's to my the hamburgers plate. in paradise argument yes. in a way yeah yes. so that that's extremely important so i want to ask you then prof what is future food since so we've got food scientists with us and uh Noshat, you are doing a lot of research um in food and and processed food we've spoken about processed food tell us what does future food look like well, there's not one answer to that, of course, because there's so many geographical and differences of economics and social class and, and also preferences. But what, there are a couple of trends I think we can see. One is that fewer and fewer people will work in the primary industry of just growing the crop. The small farms, the small full of uh, smallholders of today, I think they still number about 450 million today in the world. 
will probably not be able to survive on half a hectare. So farming will get, in, get mechanized, but mechanization doesn't necessarily mean that you take away jobs, it just relocates the jobs. Um, and the food industry, so, so you have the, the, the inputs to the agriculture, um, then you have the agriculture itself, including, of course, livestock, and then the whole processing part, that is the, going to be the biggest part. And processing means a lot of things. It's not just uh, making ultra-processed mm -hmm. foods that we are wary of, of course. You know about those because they actually, a lot of it is destroyed of the nutritional value, and on top of it, it's probably usually too salty, too fatty, etc. But the processing into foods is going to be more important. Why? Because at the other hand, uh, the other end of the, the uh, consumers, the demand will be more and more for tailor-made foods for who you are. You already see that nowadays, uh, of course, we have infant foods, but you see, for example, more attention to food for the elderly. Why? Oh, because okay. overall world population is growing older and we know also that older people need, for example, more nutrient-packed uh, foods just because their stomachs are smaller, they can in not ingest mm -hmm. sufficient food and they need a higher calorie to nutrient proportion, uh, nutrient to calorie proportion. But we will also see, we already see mm -hmm. that in the United States, for example, um, young people who want extra proteins because they're working out a lot. So you will see actually a disaggregation of consumers asking for specific tailor-made foods. Now our challenge of course is not just to cater for these uh, young American males standing in the gym all the time. It's to see how we can best produce food for those who have small incomes and need the nutrients very badly. So that, that is the challenge. But all that, the sort of personalization of food is driven by more, is actually driven by AI and by more information. And already some people have watched that shows their, their, bl their blood sugars, for example. Very soon we will have watches that measure everything from heartbeat to, to uh, your blood pressure. We already have those, but not everybody will have them yet, but they will come. The, in 2040, say 2045, most of you will still live to see that. Um, it, it's not unlikely that when you wake up in the morning, your smartwatch or whatever it looks like then says, hey, good morning. Um, <laughs> your bed, the mattress on which you're lying, is actually weighing you immediately. Sorry, I suppose this is a function you can switch off if you want, but <laughs> that function already exists. The two communicate, and your watch also says, listen, um, you're a little bit low on calcium today. The watch actually then communicates with your fridge. This is, we're talking about well of household still here. And the fridge says, yes, there is calcium enriched milk, but not so much. So the fridge tells the internet, um, <laughs> please provide more calcium enriched milk. The internet company then sends out a drone to bring the, inter the, the enriched calcium milk to your doorstep. Um, and then probably you still have to pick it up yourself from the doorstep and put it in the fridge, but even there, maybe <laughs> robotics will intervene. Um, this is a little bit of futuristic picture. Well, what it says is that we will have a huge discrepancy be between an ever-growing affluent part of the world where these things are possible, where nutrition becomes an integral part of health, of preventive health, of public health, and of course, a group of people, very important, who are lagging behind. And I think you see it as our task to at least bring up for, for people with low incomes and more nutrition problems, the possibilities of getting at least the, the knowledge of the, the good quality food and the accessibility. That's why I'm saying it's not just about nutrition, it's also about accessibility. Now, the big issue is people in these lower income groups consuming too many calories, too much fat, and um, too little protein, and above all, fewer fibers and fewer vitamins. And this is something that you cannot easily solve unless you really look at the whole food chain and the food yeah. processing. So for example, 
uh, we are making progress also in talking to, to uh, governments and big companies to take out some of the, the fats, particularly trans fats. Those are the really uh, bad fats in a way, fatty acids. Um, but also to make sure we get more fibers into the food. You can tell people, for example, you must eat more fibers. But if you are an overworked woman with three kids and you are a single parent, you come home after work, you're not going to chop up the beans and all the, the vegetables. You just have no energy. The risk is, and that's why obesity in child, uh, in child uh, care and, and children is so important and growing, is that you put those kids behind a TV with a piece of pizza. Now, yeah. you can say moralistically, oh, this is bad, the mother should have looked after her children and fed them better. You can also say, while we're doing the awareness raising for the mothers not to do this and maybe reduce their work burden a little bit, let's make sure that when she gives them pizza, this is a high fiber pizza with added minerals and, and protein where necessary so that it remains palatable and something the kids want to eat and at the same time has better nutritional values. Now we have a kind of divorce. You have health foods that are unaffordable to the people who most need it and the rest is sort of left to its own. And it's, it's just very poor food with very high calories and very low nutritional value. That should be turned around. And so I would really like to encourage all of you who are in agriculture, think also about the food chain. And the food people look, about, look at agriculture, look back. We need that whole processing to be tailor-made, not just to the rich and powerful with their, their calcium boards, but also to people who may not have access to all the technology, but at least should afford, have affordable food with the right type of nutritional value. That's a very powerful, very powerful message. I, I, I just want to, I see Prof Noshad smiling here, and he's, he's uh, the man of uh, processing. Um, and I, I'm still stuck in this future food because I want to know, do you think we will have more hamburgers in Petri dishes? Um, we, we have laboratory grown meat now. I tasted some the other day and I, I don't know, it was mind over matter. I couldn't enjoy it. Um, and, and also 3D printed food I've, I've seen. So Yeah, that's, it's good you raised this. Well, let me say on, on uh, lab grown meat, it's currently still uh, is at a prohibitive, ridiculous cost of something. I think the latest figure I heard was $19,000 a kilo. So this is just a thought experiment and nothing real. But the costs are going down quite rapidly. Do we, do we want it? Do we need it? Um, I think the most important thing is to provide meat in small quantities to the people who need it. And in a way, it doesn't matter so much how it is produced, as long as it goes to the right people. And most healthy adults, as we sit here in this room, we don't need a lot of meat. I know it's part of the tradition here, but we can do with less meat. And for all kinds of environmental reasons, it's good to do with less meat. But for growing children, infants, the elderly, pregnant women, lactating women, animal sources of food are essential because not just of the protein, but also the uh, vitamins, particularly iron that is, that is associated with it. So should we have lab meat? My, I mean, the judgment is out. If it has become affordable, yes, perhaps, but I don't think this is going to be a, a solution to any nutritional problem in the short term. Should we have fake meat? So soy-based burgers, for example, well, who has t tasted ever a, a vegetarian burger? You don't look enthusiastic, most of you. <laughs> Neither am I. Um, and the trouble is still, they're still often too salty, too much processed, and so on. Um, yes, it's a good idea to grace the awareness on a, a vegetable-based diet, including mm -hmm. beans, including the right kinds of combinations of cereals and beans or legumes. Um, I'm not, uh, not at all in favor of forbidding all meats, um, but I am in favor of teaching young people at an early age about a balanced diet. And one dimension of that that most people don't think about is that includes teaching people about cooking. My students, who I love dearly and know a lot of things about nutrition and agriculture, tell me outright to my face that their idea, their definition of cooking is what? Putting something in the microwave. 
I was aghast the first time I heard that. I said, that's not cooking. That's heating up something. That's nothing <laughs> to do with cooking. Cooking is a chemical transformational process by which you make ingredients into something that, that is culture, that's identity, that's enjoyment. It's not just a matter of a microwave. Come on. Anyway, I lost the battle to some extent, and I will not ask you how many of you think cooking is putting something in the microwave. But the point is that by cooking, <laughs> even psychologically and culturally, you put yourself in a long tradition of preparing food. It's, it's really what makes the difference between human beings and all other species in the world. We just don't eat only, or we don't only grab food, we actually process it, we cook it, we heat it, we make it different from what it was, we combine it, and, and the ways of combining food, of combining ingredients has been so instrumental in shaping who we are, because it makes food also more available, oh sorry, nutrients more available. I mean, by heating you can get all kinds of things that you couldn't ingest otherwise. By combining, for example, uh, vegetables with some, some fat, some oil, you actually improve the bioavailability of certain foods. So there are many ways in which we have become, biologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, better human beings by cooking. And by ignoring that, and having cooking, uh, in fact, sort of farmed out already, because lots of people now go for um, sort of ready-made food, instead of doing that yourself, I think you, you disconnect yourself from a tradition which is very powerful and very much also what makes us human beings. I understand if you're busy, if you're a workaholic, which you shouldn't be, but okay, let's accept that, you might go for ready-made food for sort of the, 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 the fast food. But please, make it an idea to cook at least seriously once a week. It will make it more enjoyable, you will make friends, and sharing a meal and cooking it is one of the really, truly human things to do. I think it's a very important point, uh, the cooking. Uh, the traditional knowledge around cooking, the indigenous knowledge of, of cooking and food types, and, and have we lost that? And the passion around sharing the processing or the preparing of that food and sitting together and eating the food. So the Italians are masters and the French in enjoying food in every possible way and sharing it. And That's to, in fact, my introduction to my hamburgers in paradise is actually a reflection on these nine and a half years that I spent in Rome. And I literally say in some of the first paragraphs, you know, I, as an agronomist, I always thought about food in terms of tons per hectare or maybe calories per hectare. But they, I was taught in Italy by Italians, by being there all the time, that food is about so much more. It's about identity, it's about culture, it's not about quantities, it's about quality, it's about value, and the value of sharing. I mean, Italians are, are there any Italians in the, in the room before I make a drastic mistake? Anyway, <laughs> what I love about, I can say, I can say it in front of Italians that I've done so. What I love about Italy and Italian culture is, while they are preparing one meal, and eating it, they're already thinking about the next meal, and in a positive way, they say, you know, you're doing the beans in such and such a way, but you know, my mother has a recipe, and that uh, if you do it this way for the next meal, we're going to do it that way. When I used, I used to go always sh shopping on a Saturday morning to the market there in, uh, in Rome at the Campo dei Fiori, and um, then I would buy some cheese, for example, and the, the guy selling me the cheese would say, now, this is a cheese made by the nephew of the farmer who lives next door to the village where I come from, and if you take this cheese, you must also take this cheese, because that's even better. And then, by the way, there's also that cheese. So I always <laughs> ended up with five types of cheese, and that is the joy and the passion of food. Okay, we don't need to have that every day, perhaps, but finding some of the passion about food, I think, is really something that enriches your life, that makes you friends, and you always have a conversation piece. So especially recommended for the shy people. <laughs> so, Prof, is this an example of sustainable food meals or a circular food system? The Italian system of already thinking of your next meal. And also, I want to add to it a very important discussion we had yesterday, and I see Prof Schoenefeld Hitti is, is back in the room. And we spoke about enough portion size, are we, and, and I think the Italians, I have not seen a lot of really obese Italians or French people because they, they have that joy in the food. So 
is this a, can we create a circular system, a food system? Well, I don't think the Italian food system is, is circular in the sense that everything is being used, but there is a, an awareness of waste, there's an awareness of using things and reusing things, and a cold spaghetti can be made into all kinds of things, even as a starter for making, for making bread. Uh, there is a, a general food awareness that in some other countries has not existed as much or, or, or was lost. We shouldn't, I think, idealize the Mediterranean diets, uh, but there are some elements that are important. Um, not too much fat, olive oil, but also carbohydrates. Italians are great eaters of pasta or bread. Uh, in the US, in, on the contrary, there's a whole school of people who feel that bread is, is deadly, by the, nearly deadly, and that you shouldn't eat carbohydrates at all. That is not uh, scientifically uh, justified at all, but there is this, this this fear of, of carbohydrates, which the Italians don't have. And they always drink one glass of wine. Um, and the French too, by the way. So there is this French paradox, which uh, uh, you will know about, that the French <laughs> drink, actually they also eat, um, you know, quite, quite fatty things like cheese, you know, Camembert has 50% fat, and yet they don't get fat because they don't eat a lot. And so the, 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 the real issue in our urban situations is, is yeah. that we are doing a lot of mindless eating. Uh, one of the things that really shocked me when I came back to the Netherlands after all those years in Italy and before that in, in Africa and elsewhere, is that people were eating on the streets, were munching stuff on the streets. Mm -hmm. And that was all that fast food, that ready-made stuff that you could buy everywhere. Uh, not eating. Um, just a proper meal is, is a real risk factor, especially for young people. And one of the most interest statisti interesting statistics that I know is that the sale of dining tables has actually declined in the world. Oh. Now think wow. what that means. That means that oh. people, are, people are sitting behind their screen, whatever screen it is, and eating with something on their lap, which isn't even properly cooked, but heated in a microwave. That's a major shift in cooking and eating culture. And you should be aware of that. That's not to say you can't do that ever, but you know we're losing something if we're not aware of this. That's very powerful. Uh, I know my grandchild tells me, Omar, can I go and sit in front of the TV? And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's very important to share that. I, I also want to ask you that mindless eating, uh, isn't that also food waste? If we eat too much for what our body really needs, yeah, well, first of all, you get too fat, but then also the body eliminates what it doesn't need. So uh, without going into the very details early in the morning, but a lot of what you eat uh, and what you cannot use ends up in the sewage system where we can retrieve some of that, but it's a very inefficient way. So, so learning what to eat, how to eat, when to eat, with whom to eat, how to prepare it, all that, in my view, should be part of even primary school education. And if it isn't there, we should promote it. Having, having a, a national plan, which is not about mm -hmm. just food itself, but, but including the understanding about the whole food chain, the effect on the environment, I think is, is really important. You, you earlier on mentioned food uh, fear. And I, I think it was an interesting concept. I never thought of it. And we sit with a lot of plant pathologists there in the back. And um, if, I, if I think of food fear, I think of discussions we've had around pesticide residues on food. And we also discussed that yesterday. If, if we look at the food system, can we really do without pesticides? And, and for those of you who were not in the meeting yesterday, we also spoke about the EU Green Deal, which is a big deal. So. Our food fear, how do we address it to give the perspective of that we also do need pesticides? Well, I think food fear is, is two different concepts. One is people have very idiosyncratic ideas, personal ideas about what is good and bad. And that's true in every culture. There, there are cultures in the Amazon, for example, Amazon Indians, where women are not allowed to eat fish, which is really unfortunate because that's a good ingredient. But that is because of, of some mythological uh, uh, concepts and so on. You can ask yourself as a biologist, and I consider myself a kind of applied biologist from time to time. Chat GPT was wrong because I don't have a degree in economics, uh, ah. but by the way. <laughs> so why, why are there cultures? The same is true in India. Women eat after the men. Uh, 
Why is that so? Why is food restricted for women? Well, one biological explanation of that is that by instilling a kind of fear of food or saying that certain foods are not appropriate for some people, it's also a way of having a sort of implicit birth and population control. And that might explain some of the food taboos that exist. may not always be true, but for example, the, the um, prohibitions we have in, in Islamic and Jewish religion on pork have to do in part with the, um, uh, the risk of pork being infected by all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. uh, pathogens, particularly uh, uh, gut pathogens. But most importantly, and that's only been discussed quite recently, is that there is also far more um, competition in the Middle Eastern climate over, over many, many millennia between humans and, um, and pigs. And why is that so? Because they eat more or less the same thing and they also drink a lot of water and they need shade. Whereas goats, who are not prohibited, actually are not a competition because they eat grass and they can do without shade and they drink much less. So very often there are more explanations for those food taboos or food fears and so on. That's one side of the story, it's the biological mm -hmm. side. Now, of course, in modern agriculture, um, the point is, the fundamental point is that we want to optimize the amount of produce, of yield from a given part of land. We don't want to have low yields on a lot of land. We want to have the best possible yields on a restricted area so that the rest can be untouched or less touched because you can have more carbon storage in trees, you can have more biodiversity. So optimizing the land is very important. If you optimize the land, that means that you, ha means that you have to defend your crop, for example, your maize crop, against all kinds of other organisms that also want to eat that crop. Why is that so? Because in ecology, in any ecosystem, it's a fight for life. It's a fight between all kinds of yeah. species that want to eat kind of stuff. And the more protein a crop um, has in its leaves or in its, for example, soybean, in its pulses, uh, the more uh, animals and insects and, and uh, all kinds of diseases actually attack those crops. So there is no way in which you can uh, concentrate on getting the best possible crop without protecting your crop. And that includes also, of course, without feeding your crop. If you grow a crop year and year after uh, year after year on the same piece of land, obviously the land gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. So a crop is, is like a child. It needs to be uh, nutritionally balanced. Mm -hmm. so, so there is no modern agriculture that optimizes without using some degree of chemical input. Now the word chemical in itself mm -hmm. is already a source of fear. Um, because most people don't understand their basic high school chemistry anymore, but anything, a growing of a crop, our bodies, it's all chemistry. And so what we need to do is to give a balanced narrative, a balanced story of, of why we need to protect our crops, because crop failure just means more land that needs to be used. It also means higher prices and therefore less accessibility and affordability to other people. So this optimization of the process along the way requires uh, some input of chemicals. The whole story is not to do too much, not to have residues, or as little as possible, and above all, to, to be really judicious about when you fertilize, when you put the insecticides, and lots of things go wrong, actually, because people just use too much. And that is an educational process with farmers, and particularly in horticulture, this is a huge problem. So this is a, a very important message, and I, I, I just want to go back to the chat comment. I was actually waiting for that, because this is a very important lesson for all of you, um, the weaknesses of chat and how we can use chat, but we have to be mindful. We have to critique chat because when I when I read that chat doc paper major, I immediately recognised the economics degree, and I thought not as far as I know. <laughs> not as far as I know either. So. <laughs> so, so one must be very careful when you use chat EPT. Yeah, right. Um, right. And I, I just want to go back to to another important point. You were not with us last night. We had a splendid evening and a wonderful meal and. And lovely wine, all all too was was really very good, uh, but we had incredible um, uh, presentation um, from uh, uh, Prof. Coupe, of course, and then also from Aldo, and uh, he actually paid a tribute to 
Prof. Fresco. I'm um, not going to repeat that. Huh? No, <laughs> no, but I'm going to highlight a few points, and and it was uh, it was a formidable uh, presentation. Um, but there's two things, a few things he, he mentioned. He mentioned uh, her warmth, her insightfulness, and uh, gener generosity, passion. Uh, these are extremely important. And if you look at leadership skills. Um, taking responsibility, taking initiatives, motivate and inspire. And that's so important. Understand and empathize. Uh, lead by example. Um, think strategically, flexible and creatively. And give appropriate and constructive feedback. So, Prof, you've mentioned a lot uh, throughout this discussion. What would you say was the strongest or the most important for you as a leadership skill, because you have been in a very important leadership position most of your academic career. I think in the end, uh, everything is important, of course, but in the end, it boils down to vision. I think vision is so important. If you don't know where you're going to go yeah. and you're not the captain standing on the ship, the ship can go for a long while, but if it doesn't know what is on the horizon, where you have to adjust, where you have to change tack, um, then you can be a leader, but not really a leader that goes to uncharted territories. And having a vision is not easy. It's not a matter of just, you know, thinking of it, okay, well, maybe we should do such, or in a university, my last eight years I spent as the president of our university. Um, it's not a matter of saying, okay, we want a growth percentage of our budget and our number of students by X, Y, or Z. That's not vision. Vision is, what is our role in the future? Where are we needed? Where can we make a difference? And what are the tools that are needed? For example, I've pioneered a lot of work with the private sector. I've been heavily criticized for that, um, you know, selling out science to the private sector. But my argument has always been, and I've had lots and lots of discussions on this with students, with everybody, there is no transformation in society without the private and the public sectors. We are not going to produce tractors, for example, not as a university, but the government also will not produce tractors. This is stuff that has to be done by the private sector. And by involving the private sector, yet keeping our autonomy when it comes to substance, then you can make sure that you're doing things that actually also land and can have an more immediate impact. So vision, partnership and impact are, yeah. are very much linked to me. It's also lonely, by the way, to have a vision because not everybody will share your vision. Yeah. Or people are sometimes afraid and say you go too fast or others say, no, you go too slowly. Uh, so keeping the troops with you while having a vision and listening to them. And so uh, I believe very much in having strategic sessions with when you are in a leadership position with the organization. It doesn't need to be with a big group of people, but talk about future alternatives. What are the scenarios? Mm -hmm. For example, um, just a very concrete example, the relationships between uh, Europe, the US and China are really deteriorating. I regret this very much because I think we should keep China with us for many ways, and not only because they're fantastic scientists, but also it's such an important and powerful country. And, and having a dialogue on how you organize a modern society including the de democracy of it, is an important dialogue. Isolating countries, and you know this very well in South Africa, has never been a long-term solution. And so my plea has always been to work with and for China. But at the same time, um, there was a lot of unease about China. There still is in the Netherlands. There's even now a decree that we should limit the number of foreign students, read Chinese students. Um, I'm not in favor of that, I've said so, but I've also tried to listen, where does the fear come from? What, the, what is that fear? Is it the fear of some strangers, of something foreign? Is it the fear that our ideas are stolen? Is it the fear mm -hmm. of change? You know, the, the a university or the world, this university will also look very different in 20 years. So what is the fear exactly? And you cannot develop a vision unless you understand the resistance mm -hmm. against it and understand the fear. And very often the fear is not the fear of the Chinese or not the fear of something concrete, but it's the fear of the unknown. 
It's the fear of relinquishing a current mode of life, a current way of living, and not knowing where we go. But this is life. Life is about the unknown. Life, mm -hmm. is, life is about also the excitement of finding something new and, and finding new ways of doing what you really feel must be your impact. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. I, I want to just take another step back to uh, the, the involvement and our responsibility to engage with the private sector. Um, I, on your CV, you've been a non-executive director of Unilever, very importantly for all of us, uh, and also a rubber bank, and then very importantly for us, Syngenta. Um, Prof, please share with us, I mean, what is it like to sit an, in those spaces and engage and again and as the vision. only woman ever, all the time ah. <laughs> very important well it, it's taught me a great deal and i as i said i'm firmly uh convinced that the private and the public sectors and the scientific world and the private sector need to talk together um, and we don't do that enough there's a lot of mis misunderstanding the, the big private sector also often has a very important research role uh, but more importantly, it's, it's their push also towards impact that is important. And for example, to take Unilever, because I also did a little bit of work with Unilever here in South Africa, um, my contribution there are charity boards, sustainability committees, so we looked of course at all the climate targets, but most importantly, I looked at the affordability and the nutrition qualities of the foods they were putting on the market here. So we decided at some stage as a company rule to decrease the amount of salt. Mm. Now, this is not as easy as it seems because salt is important for taste, but also if say Unilever in its soups decreases the salt and other companies don't do that, then of course uh, people will not necessarily buy your Unilever soup. So that's not a very good model for business. On the other hand, if you, result, uh, if you reduce salt too drastically, then it is known from studies, people just add the salt at home. Mm. So that's also not a good idea. So you need to have a gradual approach to these thing, things. And mm. I think my contribution has been able, has been always to really try um, to look at the, the nuance in the debate, to look at where do we go, how fast do we go, but also always from a sustainability perspective. And I've chaired in all three boards, I have always chaired the sustainability committee, which started out as something, okay, you know, it's not the audit committee, so it can't be that important. So again, with Unilever, I pushed for an integrated annual uh, report of annual accounts, which looked not just at the business figures, but also at the sustainability figures as part and parcel of our reporting to the world. And that was a, a, a real revolution because people said, oh, you can't, you can't put a figure on that. It's too complicated, it's too, it's too much work, it's too difficult, people will not understand. But I said, no. And I worked with the audit committee for, for several years in order to get that right. So what do you need on a board if ever you get there? You need a lot of patience, you need to be diplomatic, you need, again, to have a vision of where you can make a difference. And, and you have, I think you have to have something um, how can I call it? It's, it's a kind of uh, flexibility of understanding that sometimes you cannot push too much, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to push, and that comes over time. You, you, as long as you're aware of your own boundaries, you can learn to, I've made mistakes, of course, in those kinds of things, by going too fast, mm -hmm. or by speaking before I was supposed to speak, you know, how these <laughs> things are very subtle always in, in boards. You learn that, but it's most important not to lose that vision. You're not there just for yourself. You're there because you are behind a big idea. And that big idea should structure your life. Wow, that's very important. I think uh, uh, there's so many powerful messages. I hope you've all been taking notes. Um, I, I think I know they're, glued, they're glued to the screen, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what's also important is to choose your battles. Um, I, I think it's one big lesson for me in life. I wanted to fight all the battles from trying to stop billboards uh, and plastic mm -hmm. and, and waste. And um, Which battle do you think is the most important to take on? I mean, we have many battles and, and challenges. Of course, it's difficult for me to say because I don't know your environment enough. Um, I personally think 
that one of the things we should do in, in universities is uh, to battle for equal opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is the, the plastic cups and so on that we talked about. It's, that's important, but that's only a small thing. But the fact that there are young people who are bright but cannot go into university, or when they're in the university, uh, they have to drop out because there's not enough money. I, I think that is the real question. We're not using all the talents, no, probably not in South Africa and not in, in many parts of the world. It's, it, there are so many talented people, and I think that maybe the future of universities is not necessarily that you go and stay for four years or five years. Maybe the combination of online teaching with having a job and with, um, yeah. You know, some nurturing at university helps us also to reach out to more people. I don't believe that everybody should have a university degree, but I do believe that everybody should have access to education that is suitable and tailor-made to him yeah. or her. That is going to be, you know, a kind of vision for the future that maybe is a real battle mm -hmm. that you may want to take on. That's fantastic. I'm going to close off, and uh, I want to say that uh, Bongiwi Nyobe was supposed to chair this session this morning, and she's caught in, in mid-air with delayed flights. So um, I, I, I must at least ask one of her comments or questions. I'm going to end by asking you a message for the youth, and specifically in terms of sustainable agricultural leadership. What would be your message to the youth? I think my message would be remain open-minded and science-based, don't become ideological without the right foundations. There is a tendency now to generalize and to say, this is bad, um, this is good, um, biological agriculture is good, uh, or, mm -hmm. or is bad, or good, or whatever. I think what you need to have is a critical mind in food and agriculture, to ask yourself all the time, what is the scientific basis for this statement? Can I really say this? Should I say this? Is the government doing the right thing? And speak out if that's not the case, even if your colleague is saying things that you wonder about. The big advantage of a college education is that you have a sense of the science behind things. And today, in a world where, which is becoming more and more polarized into good and bad, into um, you know fears mm -hmm. and, and over-optimistic attitudes, we have to stay the course. This course is, we must take science-based decisions wherever we are. We should not become ideological because ideologies make people blind to what is really happening. And it can be quite dangerous, as we know, politically. I know you know all the examples. So remain honest, remain science-based, and speak up. Don't be afraid. Oh, don't be afraid. Thank you very much. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you for your wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Fresco and Lisa. I don't think I have anything to add. All of us, I think, agree wholeheartedly that this was an open, honest conversation, delightful, and with so much wisdom and passion that Professor Fresco has shared with all of us. Thank you very, very much again. In conclusion, I just want to make two final comments. The one is, we really cannot thank you enough, Louise, for your continuous support and commitment, not, on, not only towards the University of Pretoria, but towards South Africa and the development of the African continent. I mentioned to you earlier that Professor Fresco has taken the bold step of this uh, uh, prize that she has received, with it, which includes a, a cash component from the Germans to put that into a Louise Fresco travel fund for young people on the African continent to be able to travel between different universities. This is the one that I referred to where uh, the Moroccans will make a contribution, University of Pretoria will make a contribution, there's private sector interest, we will discuss that uh, later today and tomorrow. So there will be opportunity to travel for you. Uh, I think it will, charity begins at home, isn't it? So it's between the University of Pretoria and I will ask uh, one of our colleagues from Morocco to just speak for two or three minutes to just tell you which university they come from and how delighted and committed they also are in terms of moving this partnership forward.
morning. Thank you, Franz. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Professor Fresco, for uh, the very wise words. And uh, thank you, Lisa, for uh, uh, you know, asking the, the, the right questions to tell us about uh, the very uh, interesting path that uh, Professor Fresco shared with us with uh, modesty and humility. Um, so indeed, uh, we have been very uh, proud and happy to be part of this uh, uh, setting up of uh, the Luis Fresco Fund for mobility of uh, African students. So the university that we come from, Ms. Shrabi and myself, uh, is a very young university in Morocco. It's called uh, uh, University of Mohammed VI Polytechnic. It's based in Ben Gerir, which is not far from Marrakesh. We do have uh, two other campuses in Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco, and in Layoun, uh, which is in, in the south, in the Sahara region, to look specifically after agriculture in arid uh, regions. Uh, our university is uh, quite unique uh, in Morocco and in our region of, of the world in many, many aspects. The, the starting point, first of all, uh, is uh, around a company called OCP, which is a phosphate fertilizer company uh, that has been in, in this uh, uh, sector and in this market for more than a century, and uh, that uh, founded uh, through its uh, foundation, uh, the UM6P, uh, with one dilemma in mind, which is how uh, to make sustainable uh, the uh, agriculture business, but also the the sector in itself of uh, phosphate mining and and uh, uh, fertilizer production. Um, you know, in in in, in uh, uh, you know, in, in front of uh, many challenges that could uh, disrupt this uh, this uh, this sector. So, innovation was needed, and our true belief is that the best. Uh, the best places to organize and to see innovations happening is universities. So within that university started the first school of uh, industrial uh, engineering and management, then an agricultural school, and then it expanded over the course of five to six years to different departments uh, from uh, business uh, studies to humanities, to uh, computer science and artificial intelligence because we believe that it's the, 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 the combination and the, 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 uh, the, the crossroads of all those fields that are important for students and for researchers, researchers and, and innovators. So we are very proud to be part of this uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, setup of, of this fund because we have uh, a commitment for Africa and we do acknowledge that there is some missing uh, capabilities and facilities to make the mobility of uh, African students a reality between uh, different countries of Africa, between different universities of Africa. And we, we thought that connecting universities from the two extreme sides of Africa, from Morocco in the north and from South Africa in Pretoria, was a, a best example to, to, to give, uh, give some, some concrete sense to, 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 to that. So thank you for, uh, for uh, this, this amazing uh, opportunity and thank you for having both uh, Nawal and myself part of this, uh, this trip to, to witness this uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, uh, you know, uh, experience uh, uh, sharing with, with, with the students and uh, happy to be part of this, uh, of this fund in, in, the, in the next, uh, in the next months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this brings us to the end of the conversation. Thank you very, very much to everybody again. I think there's refreshments outside. Uh, everybody is welcome to join us for refreshments, and you could have a word or two with Professor Fresco over the refreshment period. Thank you very much, colleagues.